thank you everyone uh, for joining us and, and for taking time out of your day. Uh, I'm super excited to be here with the team from United Airlines. Um, I had the honor and the privilege over the summer of visiting uh, your office and got a tour of the Innovation Lab, which is super cool. Um, but the topic for today's conversation is immersive UX and United Airlines approach to innovation with Miro. Uh, we're going to do formal introductions in just a minute, but just to set the stage for today's sessions, session, we're going to do a little bit of intros. Uh, most of the time, we'll have a panel Q&A, uh, but we will make sure that we've got five minutes blocked at the end uh, for audience Q&A as well. So feel free to submit your questions at any time, and we'll answer as many as we can. So I can kick us off. In terms of uh, introductions, my name is Brad Weiger. I'm on the solutions engineering team here at Miro. Um, and we thought a way to get to know us just a little bit better is to add this question, who is your favorite Beatle? So speaking for myself, drums was my first instrument. So I'm gonna go with Ringo and I'll pass it next to Michael. Um. I still, I've gone through a lot of phases. I had my more like intense political John period, my sort of ambiguously spiritual George period. Definitely right now in a like silly love songs kind of Paul phase, but my runner up would be George Martin who innovated all of the recording techniques that exemplified the Beatles sort of long haired later period. Outside of the box, love it. <laughs> And who do you want to pass it to next, Michael? Uh, Jory. Well, um, I'm also going to be a little bit outside of the box and say I am not a Beatles fan. I'm sorry. Don't hurt me. Um, I am more on the like the Rolling Stones side when, you know, that question comes out around that. Like, I like the monkeys a little bit and I'm more of a Stones fan. So the Beatles, I love them all equally. Um, and I'm pretty sure that if I knew each of them individually and their talents, as Michael does, I'm pretty sure I would find myself in each one of them and not be able to pick either. So I like his answer. And I'll kick it to Derek. Hi, everyone. Derek Wilkinson. Um, my favorite Beatle is John Lennon. And uh, I, I think John Lennon was sort of punk rock before punk rock. And, you know, I'm, I'm a big punk rock fan. And so I I, I like him for that reason. Nice. And then I'll pass it to Libby. Hi, everybody. Thanks for uh, having us. Uh, my favorite Beatle, um, actually, I feel like um, Michael kind of stole the answer of saying everyone. So <laughs> I think mine's probably Sergeant Pepper um, with a runner up of Yoko Ono. Oh, controversial. <laughs> Nice. Well, thank you for sharing. One last aspect of introductions I want to, to call out um, Michael on is if you check him out on LinkedIn, which I encourage you to do, um, you'll see that in his description, he refers to himself as a Miro whisperer, which I love. I'm a little biased, but I'd love to see that. <laughs> I don't know where I am and Miro begins, Brad. <laughs> All right, so jumping in, I wanna direct this first question to Derek, if you don't mind, um, but could you tell us a little bit about what is UX at United and how do employees embrace it in their work? Sure. Well, uh, UX is super important at United and uh, especially you know when you think of our mobile app, we have a great experience in the mobile app and what consumers see, but we also being an airline, uh, we have a large operation at United with lots of users performing specific tasks and UX is super important for to, to create good experiences for those users. And so UX is just as important for employees as it is for our customers. Uh, I like to say that a good employee experience begets a good customer experience. And so uh, the team that I lead focuses on designing those experiences for employees and Miro is a big part of our process. Um, before, you know, before we put uh, pen to paper on any sort of hands-on design, we'd like to get, uh, we'd like to get our consensus and alignment with our stakeholders and facilitating design thinking workshops and, and Miro plays a big part in that, in that it, we, it's sort of our output from those workshops that we can always refer back to. 
So as we move into design, it's a it's a smoother transition, and there are no surprises when we get into design because we're we're already aligned on uh, strategy and scope. Very cool. Do a lot of your interaction with uh, United employees happen in person, or is it kind of a mix of people joining virtually? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, I would say that you know a couple you know a couple of years ago during the pandemic, obviously we were we were forced to move away from the in person uh, whiteboard workshops and using digital tools like Miro, and we and we we transitioned pretty well to that and proved that we could continue to work and do the same type of work with our design thinking workshops, our research uh, using a tool like Miro. And now, uh, now that we're more back into like what I call a hybrid environment, you know, we're still, we are talking to users in person uh, when we can, uh, we go out to the field quite a bit uh, and we're doing in-person workshops as well. And even though we may still be doing physical whiteboard activity, uh, Miro is still uh, our source of uh, where we're documenting all of that. Uh, sometimes we're doing it live for those uh, users that are remote uh, and is still attending uh, the session. And then other times it's more uh, all in person, but Miro is where all the output from the from the whiteboard activity kind of ends up and lives uh, afterwards. And so uh, it's it's been good for us in that way. Amazing. Cool. Well, thanks for sharing. Um, sure. Next question I have is for Jory. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about what is the Innovation Lab uh, and how do United Teams work collaboratively in this space? Yeah, thanks, Brad. Um, and hello, everyone. Um, so the Innovation Lab, um, it's a team, it's a function. Um, we have physical lab spaces and we're about two years old um, within United. Um, are, we're branded as AirShop, one word, um, and it's a great combination of our airline and industry as well as the tinkering and prototyping and test and learning um, that takes place um, both within our physical lab spaces um, as well as beyond them. Um, we have a purpose to protect and accelerate innovation by helping United see around corners for advantage. Um, and that's just a really sexy way of saying we're focused on emerging technologies for the future and helping apply them to the customer experience or the operational experience through our employees. Um, and ultimately, we're a group of enablers and facilitators and inspirers of innovation. Um, Miro is actually one tool that um, we love to use in one of our lab spaces that we refer to as our experiential theater. Um, and to what Derek had talked about in terms of that in-person versus virtual and then hybrid, um, we have created um, a space that allows for all of that. Um, and it actually wasn't built um, solely for um, in-person kind of brainstorming and workshopping, but it's really taken on a whole new life. Um, and you can see the, the images um, are actually all um, Miro uh, imagery, imagery projected onto the walls. Um, and uh, there's a, a group of us with, with Michael at the helm um, running a workshop um, for us actually as a team. Um, but it's, it's a lot of fun and Miro gives us that flexibility of not only bringing um, virtual and in-person teams together within our physical lab space, but also allows for um, a truly immersive experience when it comes to anything from strategizing, planning, brainstorming to actually um, solutioning what the future can hold. So we, uh, we love using Miro and we love um, our space and it was a, a great um, marriage of the two. And um, uh, kudos to, to Michael on the team. Um, he is one of uh, five individuals on the team and our lead UX researcher. Um, and as you heard, he is a, a, a lover of Miro or a whisperer of Miro. Um, and so he was really the one that, that has brought this to life. It's an amazing space. Like I said before, I got a chance to, to visit the, the lab in this room. And we actually that day had a hybrid meeting uh, where we had a couple folks from the Miro team there in person and some joining remotely. Uh, and there was a TV mounted in a way that it truly felt like we were all in the same space, yet we were immersed in this, you know, three, 
dimensional uh, three walls of Miro being projected very artfully. Um, it's it's pretty cool. It's a little disorienting if you're like me and you're kind of prone to motion sickness. You know, it can be intense, but uh, it's an inspiring space to be in. Thank you, Jory. Okay, let's keep moving. Um, the next question I'd like to direct to Libby and Michael uh, about how are UX practitioners using Miro uh, to facilitate workshops and research? So kind of what does this show up like for you in your day to day? Thanks, Brad. Um, so our practitioners all have, especially our research side, all have access to Miro. And kind of how Derek had said, we use it as a strategic sort of repository where, you know, insights from our larger projects are kind of kept there. And we do definitely um, have two kind of aspects of innovation around here. It's to borrow a phrase from Jory, there's innovation with a big eye where we see cool things like an immersion room. There's innovation with a little eye where, you know, our development teams are also starting to use Miro to do their own documentation. So it's a tool that more and more of our organizations is becoming familiar with. It's more and more of a way for us to gather in one place and see the same things, have access to the same deliverables. And, you know, even our researchers themselves, we're now kind of using it as a space to align ourselves better and get better standards around like, hey, how do we share out things? How do we look at usability testing and make sure that we're consistent so that we're capturing insights that we can really share across our organization? Awesome. Well, I can talk, you know, a little bit about how we've been thinking about Miro as like a multi-purpose research and innovation tool in Airshop. And Brad, you said something that I think is like a really appropriate starting point that when we had you at Airshop a few months ago, you're in the experiential theater, right? It feels like there's a sense of presence. It feels like people are in the room. So our experiential theater, the technical term is an immersion room. You know, there are certainly other companies using that. You know, it's used for all sorts of things like VR to create a sense of presence. So uh, what's really neat about those types of spaces too is that when you apply, you know, other types of content, if you're using Miro, there's also a sense of presence. So whereas for VR, there might be a sense of place. When we're using Miro, it's like being in this sort of like living, you know, mixed media gallery. And you know, especially in a place like Airshop, where we are prioritizing, um, imagining about new technologies, how they might fit into our organization, seeing around corners, having these types of spaces where you are put in a place where you are present with all sorts of ideas that you can, you know, put onto spaces on the fly. Um, I think it's like a really meaningful way for us to imagine and be creative and explore. So uh, one of the ways that we do that, right, through our brainstorming workshops. And I have, you can scroll down if you want, but I um, I have a few different frames here. So from a practical standpoint with Miro, we figured out the dimensions of our walls. We you know, made a frame within Miro. And when you hit presentation mode, it snaps into the space. So it covers all three walls. Um, if you notice on that, how might we brainstorm section on the bottom, there are two completely random boxes. Those correspond to like real world features. That's like a light switch and that's like a fire alarm, right? Um, the surrealist in me kind of like loves that sense of place on the mural board. So they're interesting just as, you know, remote workshop tools. We will do, you know, how might we workshop, scoping, brainstorming, alignment workshops, um, both some of the classics, you know, how might we snuff testing and things that we've developed in house. Um, but because of the sense of presence and the sort of artistic nature of the immersion rooms, we can also use it to do things like creative games, surrealist games, like this one that we've done, how does it work? Where you're trying to imagine using magical thinking ways that an object might work as a way to think out of the box and think about new and nuanced applications for some of the technologies we're exploring. Um, Miro is, you know, kind of the most appropriate uh, dynamic kind of environment for us to explore these things. And when it's married with that immersion room, it's really exciting to work with new ideas. I like this wrong answers only, just setting the setting the, the stage that this is a safe space. There's actually a question that came in um, that uh, we could answer because I think it's related to exactly what you're talking about now. Um, thank you, Maria, for the question. 
Uh, it's did you come up with that setup yourself, uh, Michael's idea? And I believe you guys did, right? Did, was that inspired from something in particular? Or? Uh, I thought it might work and it did. But <laughs> that said, that said, we've all been using, you know, the, um, you know, we, we have a really great group at Airshop who are all being thoughtful and imaginative about how we are utilizing our technology and how far we can stretch it. So it has been a space where we, you know, workshop and brainstorm in all sorts of ways. This was just the logical extension of something that we'd all been doing together. And so this is our kind of whole system. It's nice. We can bring people in, you know, who might not have familiarity with an immersion room, fair enough, right? Might not have as much familiarity with brainstorming or workshopping or Miro, and they're able to just plug and play based on their actual needs. And to ground everybody in um, those that might not have ever been in immersion room or the purposes of them, um, they can range from a couple hundred thousand dollars to millions of dollars, and they can um, be LED walls, um, ceilings, floors, round, square, spatial sound, haptics. Um, it, it can be as immersive as you want it to be into another um, environment, maybe one that doesn't exist, has never existed before, or, you know, for, you know, a company like United um, that has aircrafts and airports, um, you know, all, um, all around the globe, you know, instead of what I like to say, sometimes we're, we're a traveling circus, um, flying to an airport to, you know, see something live, you know, we don't have to do that. And we can be transported um, to that location, that realistic location without actually having to physically travel. Um, so the the originator of this, um, this space wasn't necessarily for workshops or for Miro even, it was more of this concept of merging the, the virtual and the physical world and transporting um, us to uh, a new place and being able to think differently. But at its bare minimum, we wanted to be able to project flat videos or flat content you know, onto the walls and have it be a flexible environment for um, the changing needs of all of our colleagues around um, around the company. So it is a very much a shared space that not only um, we built and we use as a team, we use alongside our colleagues, and it's also reservable for other team members um, to utilize as well. So this these are all templates or actual uh, artifacts that have been created and used, and it looks like they're all have the same uh, sort of wide banner to to maximize the use of the immersion room of those three panels. This is awesome. That's right. So yeah, you basically think about what type of, you know, it's like the ultimate sort of UX of the workshop. You're thinking about the types of people you're bringing in. You know, what makes them comfortable, what their kind of creative or UX goals are and you plug in the different types of modules that would be kind of required to reach those goals over the course of a day. Like, I think this is also something, I mean, certainly this is also something that both Libby and Derek can speak to, but I mean, I have found, um, you know, in, in my career history, I've been in, you know, tech spaces where you talk to your colleagues and someone says, I've been here for three years, I've been here forever. United is a space, right? People have been here for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. And it's, it's a much different environment. And so Miro becomes this really interesting way, right? Where we can utilize UX artifacts, draw people in, in this great equalizer where we have all these different types of tenures and experience coming together. Excellent. Okay, so being conscious of time, we've got about five, six minutes left. Um, we've got another question that's come in. Uh, thank you again for, for dropping questions in. Uh, Melanie in particular for this one. So this might not be the right space, but are you experimenting with VR and Miro? I know that there are VR setups because I saw them in the lab, but I, I'm not sure if you guys are you know, using that with Miro at this point. Jo Jory, Derek, what does my NDA allow me to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we, I wouldn't say we're doing them together, um, but we are very much um, working within VR and we are very much utilizing Miro for our VR related initiatives. Um, but it's, you know, I, I would love it. And I'm sure Michael would love to beta any new products too that Miro might have 
um, that crosses over into VR. Um, so I think that would actually, the combination of it would be really cool, but we are um, absolutely working in both um, for sure. Great, thank you for that. Awesome, another question has come in. Thanks Ryan for your question. Um, can you speak to Figma integration? Is that, uh, are you guys taking advantage of, we call it Figmiro um, at all? We haven't really um, gone that direction with the integration. We do kind of see them as like overlapping tools. Mm -hmm. um, and we kind of keep Miro as our place to do our big ideas and Figma as our place to design. Yeah, I would say Miro is sort of our researcher sandbox, if you will, and Figma is our uh, designer sandbox. But I, I think it's a good question. And are there opportunities that there's definitely probably opportunities for us to uh, integrate those in some way. But uh, at the moment, uh, we haven't done that. Right on. Uh, there's we have experimented kind of very briefly with um, some other integrations, though. Yeah. Um, and Airtable, for example, is a tool that our researchers use. And there are some integrations with Miro that we're trying to implement so that we can kind of, you know, kind of get that process smoothed out and capturing our insights. Very cool. Any other integrations that come to mind that that uh, you've found useful? Okay. It's okay if not. But we've got another question also from Ryan. Thank you for the questions, Ryan. Um, how do you take UX, some wireframing, and pull it into or pull in a team that might not be using Figma, for example? So specifically, take a problem space, use design thinking, parse out jobs to be done, and then start to wireframe. I mean, Derek, you got it? Yeah, I think um, I can take a crack at this and if you guys want to add on to it, but I think um, if I'm following the question correctly about teams not using Figma, I think, I think, Part of our research and our design thinking workshops and Miro using Miro to facilitate that is really about identifying what the problem we're trying to solve and and making sure that uh, we're prioritizing you know how how we're going to solve that problem and getting alignment with stakeholders. And I think in my in my mind, it's not always that simple, but if we can get that part uh, on paper, then I think it makes the designers' jobs a lot easier uh, so that we're not like throwing darts at the wall. Um, so that would be how I'd, I'd answer that question. And, and obviously our designers will be the ones kind of doing a lot of the wireframing in Figma. A lot of our teams beyond um, our business, our you know, development teams don't use Figma. So it is, so Miro kind of comes to space for like alignment on our business side, alignment on, you know, some of our operational side even. Got it. Okay, we've got more questions coming in. I think we probably only have time for one more before we say thank you for the session. Um, okay, this one's pretty broad and anyone feel free to jump in, but what's the one thing you wish everyone knew about how you personally use Miro if you haven't already covered it? I'll jump in first. Um, so I I think Miro is a great way to be able to show up differently for teams that have never seen it or used it before. And it was something that I adopted when we first established our innovation lab team um, to help create our brand and our image within the company. Um, we are like any big corporate PowerPoint heavy, everybody loves to put together, you know, a deck. I cannot stand building PowerPoints. And um, I had known about Miro from working with Derek on the business side before I joined this team. And I really loved how flexible it is and how um, it really allowed me to be able to expand, you know, how I wanted to convey a thought um, and be able to document what I needed to and show it to to leaders. And so I actually started to use it not only to organize myself and our team, um, but also to um, present unique ideas or business cases. And being an innovation lab was actually um, beneficial for me to show up and use Miro in that way. And I think if more people um, 
I hate to say this, but but thought outside the box and got creative with even the tools that they used and and used even um, you know non traditional tools or I should say traditional tools in non traditional ways. Um, I think it would be really exciting to see you know their growth and their creativity. Um, innovation is is also about process and the way you think. Um, and so that's that's my what I would say is as kind of my one thing. Um, I don't know if anyone else uh, has anything, Derek. I would add to that too, in that I just think the versatility of the tool is so powerful. And that, you know, when we think of uh, agile uh, development, you know, we have a lot of teams that are using uh, with when it comes to our design sprints, like putting the user stories on Miro that we're that we're designing to, and and uh, almost almost like a project management tool in a sense of laying out uh, the work at hand. And that way, all our stakeholders can not only see the work that we're doing, but but uh, the, the sequencing of it. And so I think it helps with the agile teams to kind of have a, a central place for them all to go to to track to track the work. Awesome. OK, I hate to cut us short. Love to continue this conversation, but we're at time. Um, I've also got this quote from Michael that Miro is a sense of presence. I really like that. Thanks for sharing. Uh, but thank you everyone for joining. Uh, please uh, find us on LinkedIn and have a great rest of your day and a great rest of your distributed. Thanks for having us, Brad. Bye.